Praise be Jesus through the heart of Mary. Welcome back, brothers and sisters, to the second in this series of uh, talks on salvation history. Uh, I just want to, before I begin this uh, this second talk, I just want to make a point about the first talk. I made an error there. Um, there's, I'd said that there was an expression that um, points to Adam's priesthood over the uh, cosmological temple of creation uh, in the Garden of Eden. And I said that that was uh, to till and to share. Actually, it's an expression uh, slightly different. The, the better translation is to till and to keep. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point before we begin. Um, so we're continuing our talk here about salvation history and what it teaches us about how we should teach in the light of God's teaching style. Uh, so salvation history, uh, written by the word inspired uh, in sacred scripture, is uh, all of it is is what the catechism calls the single utterance of Christ. Okay, so it, it all prepares for and suggests and uh, fully manifests the reality of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Um, so this word is not explicit, of course, in the 46 books of the Old uh, Testament, but is explicit in the 27 books in the New Testament. Um, uh, it, it, it's implicit. There are certain clues in the Old Testament uh, as to Christ, uh, not only as to Christ, but as to his church and as to the everlasting life uh, that he shares with us through the life of the church. Uh, now these, this, these words may be uh, through the prophetic words uh, of the major and minor prophets about the coming of the Messiah, perhaps most particularly in uh, you know, the famous suffering servant passage in Isaiah where we learn that the Messiah uh, will, be a, will be a suffering servant. Uh, it could be in the Eucharistic prefigurement such as the manna in the desert uh, or the near sacrifice of Abraham's son Isaac on Mount Moriah where God promises the Lamb of God. Um, and it, but it could be also in, in certain grammatical allusions. We go right back to the first lines in Genesis and we hear uh, the, the, the suggestion of the three persons of the Trinity. Uh, so we hear that God speaks a word, okay, and if the word is the Son and the one who's speaking is the Father, uh, and then we hear that the Spirit is hovering over the waters, we're beginning to get that suggestion that God is three persons in one nature. Now, of course, the, the author of uh, Genesis wasn't aware of that Trinitarian truth, uh, and they did didn't need to be. There are two authors of sacred scripture. There's always the human author and then there's always the Holy Spirit uh, who is inspiring the human author, sometimes uh, to, to, to write things that are beyond the, the, the comprehension of the human author. Um, so these, these uh, prefigurements, as I say, they're not just of Christ but also of the church uh, and of the eternal life that's, that's uh, promised to us. Um, what we're getting at here is there are certain ways of reading sacred scripture and also sacred tradition uh, with the heart and the mind of the church. And of course, as catechists, we want always to be able to uh, teach these ways to the initiates into uh, the church uh, such that they'll gain all the all the riches that are promised to us by so doing. Um, so there's a, a meaning of scripture. We begin with a literal meaning. There's always a literal meaning, not necessarily a literalistic meaning. We have to be aware of the uh, genre and the intention of the author and the historical circumstances. Uh, then there are the, 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 the spiritual truths that transcend history. Uh, there are the spiritual senses that come from the literal sense. Uh, and these are the three that I've mentioned about Christ, the church and eternal life. Um, now, of course, we're used to actually uh, uh, living out, uh, you know, hearing the word and living the word uh, in this way. When we go to uh, Holy Mass, we get to hear in the liturgy of the word the readings from the Old Covenant and the readings from the New. So we see these types of Christ, the Church, and everlasting life, uh, both in their prefigurement and in their fulfillment. We, we hear that during the liturgy of the word at every Holy Mass. Um, I said that Adam is a, is a type of the priesthood and of the prophetic role and of the kingship of Christ. Um, and we see, of course, through salvation history that there are uh, many priests, many prophets, many kings. Uh, we see Melchizedek, the priest who offers bread and wine in that prefigurement of the Eucharist. Uh, and, and Melchizedek is also a, a king, interestingly, uh, the king of Salem, of Jerusalem. Uh, then we hear the major and the minor prophets. Uh, and we hear, of course, the, the, the prophet of, of the law of God, who is Moses. Uh, and we see Christ is the new Moses who takes those ten commandments, the exterior righteousness of the Ten Commandments, uh, and shows how they should lead to an interior righteousness through the eight Beatitudes and the law of love. Um, 
why does why does God want to lead us to this interior righteousness? Why does he want to perfect this exterior holiness? Well, because he wants us to become sons in the son who is Jesus Christ. He wants us to enter into the life of Christ so uh, so that we can enter into the divine life of the persons of the Trinity. Throughout salvation history, man seeks to atone for his for his sin. He seeks to make sacrifices to God in order to try and bridge what is effectively an immeasurable gulf between man and God. And we see this from very early on when Cain and Abel fall out on the nature of sacrifice. Uh, so God respects Abel's sacrifice because Abel gives the best of his flock. He gives the first of his flock. So it's a genuine sacrifice. Uh, whereas Whereas uh, Cain gives only some of his crop, so he's not sincere in his in his sacrifice. Um, Adam, of course, is is not only called to be um, a priest, a prophet, and a king. He's also called to be a son of God with a small s. Um, so in his nature, uh, being made in the image and likeness of God, uh, he he is he is by nature um, a child of God, uh, and and sin throws him out of that relationship just as it throws him out of the roles of priest and prophet and king. So we're we're awaiting the Son of God again, and we hear that Israel is referred to as a son of God. The whole nation is referred to as a son of God. Solomon is referred to as a son of God. He's the first individual person referred to. Uh, in that term, because he is preparing for the Davidic kingdom. Uh, sorry, he's within the Davidic kingdom that prepares for uh, the coming of the king of kings, who is Christ, who is also, of course, the son of God with a capital S. OK, he is consubstantial in his nature. OK, so he's not a created son of God. He's an uncreated, begotten, not made uh, son of God, who, of course, is able to fulfill this great history of seeking to atone for our sin because he is the perfect victim as well as the perfect priest to offer himself in what Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, refers to as the new and everlasting covenant. Uh, that is what, brothers and sisters, our holy mass. The whole of salvation history is fulfilled in our holy mass, where the Lamb of God offers himself to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit on behalf of us all. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that Christ came for four reasons, brothers and sisters. The first, to save us from our sins. The second, to reconcile us to the Father. Uh, the third, to be our model of holiness. And the fourth, to make us partakers of divine nature, as, uh, as our first Pope Peter says. OK, now these four are all fulfilled in the Eucharist. They're all fulfilled in Holy Mass. Sacred Scripture is a liturgical document. Uh, it is written to be spoken within liturgy, and liturgy is where the very reality of Scripture and salvation history is fully embodied for us. It's where um, all those truths are recapitulated in the person of Christ and in his sacrifice on Calvary. So imagine if we could see the whole of salvation history laid out for us uh, um, in front of the altar, awaiting for that Son of God who truly saves us. Uh, imagine if we could see the Exodus. Imagine if we could see uh, the parting of the of, of the seas, the parting of the Jordan, Solomon's temple, uh, the earthquake on the day of Christ's sacrifice that split the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. Imagine if we could see all of that laid out for us. Then we'd truly know the reality of Holy Mass, brothers and sisters. We'd know that salvation history is being fulfilled uh, in front of our very eyes. This story is a story of love. It's a love story written by God on behalf of us all. Uh, and we need to rejoice in it, brothers and sisters, such that that joy can become, if you like, an infectious evangelization tool uh, for those whom we seek to initiate into uh, the sacraments. Praise be Jesus through the heart of Mary.